Good afternoon. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are um, meeting this afternoon to take some initial testimony from uh, members of the executive branch regarding the executive order creating an agency of public safety. Um, so thank you to Commissioner Sherling and thank you to Jay Johnson for being here today. Um, before we get started uh, with the commissioner, I did wanna take a moment um, just to have a conversation with you, Jay, um, because I, in you know, my first reading of, uh, of this uh, rather sizable change, um, I noted that you know, this reorganization would create conflicts with existing statute. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanted to just check in with you as the governor's legal counsel um, to find out if you have thoughts on offering um, uh, bill language that would achieve the statutory changes that you envision uh, in this executive order. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have not prepared draft legislation, um, primarily because the executive order itself, um, the process contemplates restructuring that would conflict with statute. So what every executive order does when it does this historically is essentially lay out the framework, um, make the changes in the executive order, and then where necessary, I think there is usually some kind of con confirmation um, over time by legislative council. Confirmation. Com uh, I'm not conformation. So they can form it um, over time. Um, okay. And actually um, for some of this, um, some of this is contemplated in exact in, 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 and it's, it's noted in certain places in the executive order. So for example, changes to DMV, um, if you look in Title 23, some of that is already contemplated. Um, and how the Department of Public Safety works with the wardens is there's some of that already in statute. Um, so, I mean, some of it is, is facilitated by that, but I think that the way that this has been done historically is that the EO speaks for itself and any changes that need to be made are made by the legislature or they proceed by, sort of considering the executive order to be the codification. Um, there are just different ways that I think Ledge Council has chosen to do it in the past. Okay, I'm unaware of any um, process by which uh, statutes can be changed this dramatically by um, without uh, an act of the legislature being signed into law by the governor. Well, if you look at um, 3VSA 2002, that's exactly what's contemplated. And then there's a process in there for that. Okay, thank you for that reference. Um, John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to follow up on that question. Um, you know, I was, I was looking at the, um, the fourth whereas clause, one, no, one, two, three, four, but well, the one that discusses that the Criminal Justice Council will retain its independence. Mm -hmm. um, however, there's nothing in the executive order that actually implements that, except for that statement, um, which is not authoritative. So, I mean, how does that happen? Actually, if you look at the section where in the executive order where the transfer of the Criminal Justice Council is made, that's done a couple of ways. Um, one is a notwithstanding provision um, that says that notwithstanding anything in the executive order, the Criminal Justice Council remains responsible for the, its functions. Um, if, you, if you look at that provision of the executive order, I don't know if you need me to help you find that. I, I don't have that up right now. No, I can find it. Okay. Thank you. So I have, um, I have another question uh, regarding the second whereas clause in your executive order. Um, and this was a bit of a head scratcher to me because um, the second whereas clause states that unless disapproved by both houses of the General Assembly, um, our Legislative Council um, has, uh, has reminded us clearly and in reviewing uh, previous executive orders 
uh, issued by this administration um, that disapproval needs to happen by resolution of one chamber, so, so the House or the Senate. So I just wanted to double check to make sure before we embark on spending time on the substance uh, that we all understand the process that goes into approval or disapproval of an executive order. So in 2017, we issued three restructuring executive orders. One was ADS, which went through. One was an agency of economic development that was shot down. And then Department of Liquor and Lottery was also shot down, but then later codified in statute the following year. So there are different ways that the legislature has handled this. We noted at the time in those executive orders that it was all pursuant to 2002, which refers to a one house veto. Since that time, we've become aware of the, and you know that was obviously in the first 15 days of the first biennium that the governor was governor. Um, and I, honestly, that I was counsel. Um, so since that time, we've become aware um, and more sort of um, knowledgeable about the provisions regarding this process in the Vermont Constitution, as well as US Supreme Court case law. And that is why we felt that it was necessary to point out to the legislature that um, our, our belief that you will need a two house uh, disapproval in order to act to um, invalidate the governor's executive order. And I don't think it's appropriate actually to get into a, a legal debate on this topic. I'm, I don't know if you're aware, but we have been sued on this matter. So as you know, different lawyers can, can reasonable lawyers can disagree. Um, the law is what it says on its face, that it's one house. Um, there is obviously a constitutional provision, the enactments clause in chapter two, section six, section six of chapter two, and also US case law, INS v. Chatta, which makes clear that a one house veto is unconstitutional. That said, we've also been sued where we're the, 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 the plaintiff is, is claiming that the entire legislative process, the entire provision, um, for this action is unconstitutional. So since it's in the courts, we're thinking that the most appropriate venue for this to be resolved is in the courts. Um, okay, so could you, I, we don't need to get into, uh, as you say, a debate on this at this moment. I know that I only um, heard confirmation that you were able to join us this afternoon less than two hours ago. And so I, I wouldn't be at all surprised um, if you didn't have uh, a full briefing available for us, but can you point us to the, um, to the case law that you're talking about or the- Well, so the case law is a, is a, is a law or is a case called INS v. Chata. Um, it's a US Supreme Court case. Um, I also just sent to the to your uh, administrative assistant um, an opinion from 2017 where Michael Grady actually um, briefs um, Representative Oliver Olson on the the two the sort of the two sides of the issue. So um, there has been a little bit of chatter that I have not necessarily been privy to with respect to that. Um, to that memo, and I understand that um, that it was not ever publicly released. Uh, maybe Amarin, you can help me understand, or Luke. Um, what what was the status of that memo, and why is it now no longer on our committee page? Uh, if you can just remind me, thank you. Sure, the status of that memo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Luke Marlan, Director of Legislative Council. <clears throat> the status of that memo was, was written for a client, a former representative by one of the attorneys in my office. And as you know, attorney-client privilege attaches to our legal opinions and our legal work product. Uh, Michael, I've been in touch with him. He's out on leave right now, but he does not remember if that was ever released publicly. Apparently, governor's council has obtained a copy of it, but we don't know, and Michael doesn't remember if it was ever released publicly or discussed in committee. And the client's privilege stays with attorney work product with the memo, 
even if it is available through other means. So we don't know if it's still privileged. We don't know if Oliver Olson <clears throat> ever waived that privilege. If he did not, it should not be released publicly. If he did, it is fine to post it. So that was the issue I raised with other committees when they were sent the same memo and it was posted. Um, it was a memo done quickly for a client in which, as Jay Johnson says, Michael laid out the arguments on either side, the constitutional arguments. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from committee members on, on the topic here? All right, Jay, any other information you can share with us to orient us to how you arrived at at this um, at the language that you put before us in the executive order. Um, really, I think it's the enactments clause, which is, and I would consider under using that language to be an other thing that requires to, action by the both bodies. Um, the Chada case, INS v. Chada, um, and. I think, again, since this is in the courts, we would want the courts making this determination. Um, I think if, if uh, Attorney Martland wanted to, he could follow up with former Representative Olson to determine whether he has waived the privilege. Um, but I think the fact that it was issued and it's before the committee is um, no reason to disregard the arguments made in the uh, opinion. I apologize, I'm not an attorney, so I'm gonna ask a question that may seem um, naive or uninformed, but um, I hope you'll give it a shot. Um, you are telling us that, the, uh, that this executive order uh, provision is in the courts at this moment, um, and that for that reason, you are changing your interpretation of the requirement for two bodies to disagree. Uh, you're, you're suggesting that 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 is how you are going to interpret this because it is in the courts. Um, yet the, the statute very clearly says one body. So I'm just a little confused as to how you use the, um, the executive order powers that have been in statute since 1970, I believe. Um, but choose to change that part of the process? Well, I think that um, it, it's not my decision. I think that it's very clear in the case of INS Fichada, which was actually um, decided in 1983, that the one house veto is something that's unconstitutional when it has binding effect on the executive or others. So, um, as um, Attorney O'Grady notes in his memo, um, there's a good argument to be made that this action is legislative in character and would require the action of two bodies. So this is not my decision. I think this is an interpretation of existing law that I think needs to be applied. Okay, I'm still a little bit confused. Um, John Gannon. So, Jay, are you familiar with any Vermont Supreme Court cases that have addressed executive orders? I am not. With respect, in, in this regard, actually, I am not, um, generally speaking, I guess I'd have to, I so guess I'm not right now, yeah. So you're not familiar with in re grievance of hood? I'm sorry, of what? In re grievance of hood. I am not familiar with that. Okay, that did discuss executive orders and the ability of one house to reject one. Okay, can you give me the year uh, and the citation 156 on VT 412. I'm sorry, one more time? 156 VT 412. Okay, uh, and uh, would you be willing to share with me and the committee what the court holds in that case? Um, it's in a footnote, but it said that it indicates that at least the court reviewed an executive order and then it didn't have any issue with respect to the process. And noted the process that one house could reject an executive order. That's in the footnote? Yep. 
Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I, I guess footnotes generally aren't binding as precedent, but I'm happy to take a look at it. I have uh, Mike Merwicki next. All right. Lower hand, unmute. So, uh, Madam oh, Chair. And I given... just might note for the, you know, Excuse again, <laughs> this is in, in litigation now. Um, all of this is public. So to the extent any of this can be used by the complaint and it, it will be used. So I, I'm happy to continue the conversation, but I would just note that again, we would prefer this to be resolved in the courts. I'm sorry to cut you off representative. So thank you. Um, given all that, Madam Chair, uh, I wonder if our committee time could be better used not hearing from Commissioner Sherling or, or any of this right now uh, but we put it to a vote of the House to up or down on, on this proposal. If, if it's in the courts or if they're looking for something from the House, I don't see why we should take up committee time to hear about the proposal when uh, it's problematic as to whether it's, it's, it's legal, legal at all. And we have lots of other things we could do with our committee time. I can appreciate that perspective. Um, we are trying to drill down a little bit into understanding uh, the, the legal thoughts that have been put in front of us. Um, so hold that thought. Uh, Mike McCarthy. Thanks, and I, I am cognizant of the fact that we're struggling a little bit with trying to understand what uh, our role is going to be given this that this is in the courts, but I'm wondering if the the memo that we're being that's been discussed and the the precedent that's been referenced, the INS Vichada, really, uh, you know, <laughs> we're it, it, that's getting into the very specific about what we're allowed to do, and I'm wondering it as one body versus two. But I'm wondering if Jan could talk a little bit about the, the difference between when the executive does something that's already been authorized and one body of the, the you know, versus we're being asked in this executive order um, to either affirm or deny uh, a change that isn't already set out in statute. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, the ability to change um, what's in the executive order isn't already something that we've legislated. So I'm just, I'm wondering <laughs> if the, if the uh, case law here that's being cited in the Olson memo really applies. Uh, I would say that the constitution in Vermont is what applies. Um, and the enactments clause actually requires two houses to take an action that's binding on the executive or others when it comes to substantive rights. Um, I don't know of any other, and I'm, of course I'm, I'm open to, to being corrected on this, um, examples of when one body of the legislature acts alone um, other than through constitutional construct. Um, the other thing I would just like to note, I think um, for Representative Merwicki is because it's in the courts and because the courts are aware that there is a timeline, um, it does seem to me that we would encourage the bodies to continue their review on the merits, just because you may have an answer um, at the end of the day. And if, if you are listening to your counsel and your counsel is saying that you can go forward with one house, there is no reason not to proceed on the merits. Um, I mean, that would be, that would be my, um, I would say that, that there is, you know, to the extent that this is provided for in law to just dump the baby out with the bathwater and not even consider the merits seems to be a, a, a mistake at this early stage. And both bodies act in, you know, jointly often. I mean, I, I guess I don't see what the problem is exactly. Could I ask a follow-up to that point, sure. Madam Chair? Oh. So I'm just wondering why then this, is, this uh, change was presented to us as an executive order. I mean, why, why not put draft legislation before us that we could consider? 
So again, this is a process that's been allowed in statute. So we took advantage of it. It's got a very, very limited window. We have 15 days at the start of every new biennium. So we have taken advantage of this process as we have in the past. If, if, you, if the legislature in its wisdom thinks that this should be done through legislation, it has chosen to do that in the past. It did that with the Department of Liquor and Laundry. So we have presented you with a proposal that would have the force of law if it's effective. Um, the legislature is being asked to consider the proposal, um, but the legislature in its wisdom could decide that it would rather do this through legislative enactment. It's just that this is the time for us to put forward a proposal in this manner, and we have chosen to do so. The other thing is, I think the rationale for doing it now was that this has this isn't an, a new concept. I mean, this is something that has been floated with, I think, um, both bodies. It's been discussed in various committees. I think we have some seen some support in the Senate. Um, so we were, I think we were optimistic that this would at least be heard um, because it's just, it's not a surprise. It's not a new concept that's being floated with the legislature. All right, I've got John Gannon next. Thank you. Uh, so given your, your citing of the Grady, Grady memo, I mean, it acknowledges that this whole process, including the ex executive order itself could be found unconstitutional. So I'm baffled that you're, you're pursuing an executive order given your, your statements. I actually think, um, and I think I heard Attorney Martland say this in the last committee hearing that I participated in, um, there is this concept of severability where the courts can actually decide that even if a provision of a statute is unconstitutional, the rest of it could stand if, and, and I believe that in this case, because there is a constitutional process for accomplishing the same end, there is no vacuum. Um, I believe that you could actually proceed with the reviewing the executive order and take action by both houses. And there is no gap in the law there. Well, what if the court disagrees? Well, that's what makes court cases. I mean, if, you, if the legislature is now reconsidering the authority that it's given the governor, that's a different issue. Well, I'm not, I'm just, you cited this memo as, as the gold standard, so to speak. And so it does say the entire process could be found unconstitutional. I don't believe well, it says the entire process. process. That's unconstitutional. I don't believe it says the entire process. I think that the legislature could easily empower the governor, you know, authorize the governor to, to, to proceed with an executive order for an executive branch reorganization what we believe is unconstitutional, which I believe could easily be severable, is the provision for the one house veto. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Luke Martland. I'm sorry, I withdraw my comment, I'll wait. It was about the whole issue of whether this memo is in the public realm or not. I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you um, staying tuned. Um, uh, Mike McCarthy, are you good? Okay. Yes. Uh, Mark Mark Higley, go ahead. Yeah, I for one would uh, appreciate hearing the merits and the changes in this executive order, and I also agree that uh, even though the House and Senate are are is in separate bodies in a sense, uh, I also agree that. Uh, uh, they, they more or less go along for the most part, and especially on something like this. So I, I just assume here the merits for one, I would, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. We will certainly get to that. Um, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have never experienced this before. So a piece of paper got sent somewhere and then got deposited with us. And I'm not entirely sure of what the actual process is for this to be completed. I've heard that somebody may file a uh, objection to it and that puts the end to it. Is it the whole house? Is it an individual member that files a resolution? What is the actual process we're talking about here? And, uh, and that, while the attorneys are chewing that around, 
uh, is there no room for precedent since this is not a novel case that has come forward? Uh, this has been executed several times before, I would assume. So the purpose of this conversation really, um, in my mind, um, before we get to Commissioner Sherling on the substance of an agency of public safety is really to, um, to establish that the legislature reads uh, 3 VSA chapter 41 uh, to read that either body may disagree uh, by passage of a resolution. So that resolution in this case uh, could originate in this committee regarding this executive order or in the Natural Resources Committee regarding the Act 250 executive order, or it could originate in either of the Senate committees to which the executive orders have been referred. So committee-based, not individual member-based? I think it would be referred to a committee if an inv individual member were to introduce a resolution to that effect, because it's the policy committee who uh, who needs to decide whether this is the right way to proceed. And um, my hope with this conversation was to get some of the procedural legal uh, issues out of the way before we get to the substance of it. Um, and I'm not sure that we've actually uh, gotten a whole lot of clarity. I mean, one, one additional option would be that you could, neither body could take an action and it would have the force of law, which obviously is the path that we prefer. I can appreciate that. I think you can probably also appreciate the great deal of um, statutory changes that would need to be drafted and, uh, and subsequently passed in order to uh, make sure that the structure of government in practice doesn't violate what is in statute right now. And, um, and so I can assure you that we will come back to that question uh, if and when we decide to, uh, to, to pursue this executive order and this restructuring. Sure, I can appreciate that, thank you. Any other questions from committee members or thoughts from Legislative Council, Luke Martland? I do have some thoughts, Madam Chair. Uh, did you want to hear them? I don't want to get into the weeds of arguing specific constitutional cases, but I think it might be helpful to the committee to focus on certain key points about what it's being asked to do. Would that be helpful? I, I think it would be because I'm sure that we're going to want to do some more thinking about this um, before we decide how to proceed. So uh, we can take another five or 10 minutes on this before we uh, get to Commissioner Sherling. Well, thank you. And I think it might be helpful to just step back for a second and look at the current law. The current law, which is 3 VSA Chapter 41, was passed, I believe, in 1970. So it's been on the book for decades and used for the decades. And if you read that chapter, I think it appears to be an effort to allow the governor to um, expedite reorganizations, but also allow the General Assembly to have a voice. And as I mentioned, this has been applied for 50 years, including multiple times by the current administration. So the current law is very clear. It's black and white in Vermont statutes annotated, and it only requires a one body disapproval resolution. Now, I think you can make valid constitutional arguments on either side. It's an unusual law and it's an unusual structure. So we're not claiming that it, there is no question as to its constitutionality. To the contrary, we think valid arguments could be made, but valid arguments could be made on both sides. And I won't go into those today, but these are based on the exactly the same cases that Jay Johnson is referencing in other case law and also the constitutional provisions. So the takeaway is you have a valid law on the books that's been applied for 50 years, that's very clear on its face, but if it was litigated, and now for the first time, the constitutionality may be litigated, you could make valid arguments on either side. So where does that leave the committee? First of all, governor's council is attempting to rewrite the statute. She wants to change the word either, as an either body could pass a disapproval resolution to both. So she wants to rewrite the existing law. 
that's not the governor's role, nor is it my role, nor is it the committee's role, that only can be done through amending the existing law. Now, the impact of this suggested change obviously makes the General Assembly's job more difficult. And now I'm talking as your attorney, so I'm a little more opinionated, but they're asking you to jump over a higher bar. Instead, instead of a one house disapproval resolution, now they claim, contrary to the statute, it has to be a two body disapproval resolution. And obviously that may be more difficult or more, may take more time. Now, if the governor is concerned about the constitutionality of the statute, they could pursue the bill option, which has already been suggested. They could introduce a bill. They could have someone on the committee who supports the idea uh, submit a bill and it will go through the normal process. Or they could stop while the case is litigated. So now we have a case before the court. We don't know if it'll be a proceed, uh, proceed or not. It could be dismissed. We don't know if the court will address the constitutional issues. But at least for the first time, we have a claim before a court which is raising these constitutional issues. So one other option is you withdraw the EO or stop this process in its tracks and wait for the court to decide these issues. But until a court decides that the statute is unconstitutional, it's valid, it's on the books, and it can be used. And in essence, the governor is saying, let's use this statute to achieve this reorganization. We're not gonna do it through a bill, we're gonna do it through the EO, but we also wanna rewrite the statute to make the General Assembly have to jump higher and jump over a higher bar to do a two house resolution disapproving. And I don't think that's a very valid argument. There's a couple of other points I'll make and then I'll be glad to answer questions. We are very prepared to talk about INS versus Chattel, all the other cases, the constitutional issues. We love this stuff. We like talking about it, but I don't know if it's really before the committee at this point. If the committee wants to go into that, I would welcome the opportunity. And I'd welcome the opportunity to hear uh, Jay Johnson's thoughts you know, fully fleshed out and anyone else and any other witness, and we could then respond as appropriate. But it seems to me that's not necessarily before the committee right now. There was a question about whether you should make statute consistent with this EO if it proceeds. And our answer is yes, most definitely. You don't want statute to be inconsistent with the EO. So even if the EO goes into effect, we think you need to make statute comply with it. And the best option is to do it at roughly the same time which would be to have a bill that, re that makes all the statutes consistent with the EO that would pass hopefully at roughly the same time that the EO becomes law. So we think that's very important because you don't want a disagreement between the terms of the EO and what's in the actual statute as codified law. The final point I'd make is about the memo. We're not running away from anything in the memo. The memo merely states that arguments can be made on both sides. I'm fully able and willing to drill down on all those arguments as much as this committee wants, but we respect your confidentiality very much and we take it very seriously. That's why I raise the issue of whether that memo is appropriately in the public domain. That's the issue. We're not trying to cover up anything. It's just we respect your confidentiality and we take it very seriously. I'd be glad to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you, Luke. Uh, committee members, do you have any questions for legislative council? Mike Merwicki. Thank you. And <clears throat> I, I sometimes forget that uh, Luke and the others are our lawyers and uh, we can ask them these questions. And, and I don't need an answer right now, Luke, uh, or um, council, um, but your, your opinion uh, on how we should proceed, if we should proceed, if we should put a pin in this and uh, wait until things unfold, or um, it's not clear to me. Um, my personal preference is to put it on hold and uh, work on other things. The only thing I would say is we take no position as to the merits of the reorganization. 
So if you like the merits, do nothing, let it proceed. If you don't like it for any reason, DEO for any reason, then you have the option of disapproving it. If you disapprove it, should be a one body disapproval resolution. Thank you. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I guess I do look at this a little bit differently. I, I would encourage us to, to pursue this and hear all the different facets and aspects of this. Um, the, the concern about whether it's gonna be a disapproved by one or two bodies is down the road and that's assuming that it's gonna be disapproved. Maybe after going through this and having everybody speak to it, we could decide that it does have a lot of merit and is worth pursuing. Um, so I would encourage us to go through and take all the testimony that's appropriate to make the determination as to whether or not it should be supported or disapproved. Thanks, Rob. I can appreciate that perspective. Um, I would, I guess, say that in the event that we decide uh, we would like to pursue this on its merits, um, we would prefer for the conforming statutes to be proposed um, by the executive branch and, uh, and have us take the opportunity to look at the statutory changes necessary to achieve this. So, um, Jay, I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, this has been a, um, an interesting conversation. It's always fun to, to have more than one lawyer in the room because you can get more than more than four opinions sometimes. <laughs> That's right. You're the first person I've ever heard say it's always fun to have more than one lawyer in the room. <laughs> Um, so committee, unless there are any last questions for Jay Johnson, um, I think we can let her go on her way. I'm not seeing anybody diving for their little blue hand. So thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. And um, we look forward to talking again. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Commissioner Sherling, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I apologize that, um, that we had to put you on hold for a moment um, while we spoke with Governor's Council, but uh, at this point, I would like to welcome you to, uh, to, to take your high level um, uh, proposal of an agency of public safety and help this committee understand um, what you think the benefits are and what that would look like um, and how that would work for Vermonters. So take it away. Sure, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, Mike Sherling, uh, Commissioner of Public Safety. And uh, if only I could uh, take credit for this, the, the work on this began actually before I was born. Um, this has been something that's been contemplated. The, the organization of public safety assets has been contemplated in Vermont for 51 years. There are at least 23 significant studies and reports that have been done. Many of them have been done by uh, the General Assembly uh, on the organization of public safety assets in Vermont. Um, they generally take two forms, uh, the organization of municipal assets, which typically ends in, in various recommendations around regionalized safety services, and those that address the organization of state assets, which typically end um, or almost universally end uh, with recommendations that are similar to what's been um, outlined in this particular executive order, most recently with uh, legislation that Senator White introduced during the last biennium uh, in its original form, S-124 had an agency of public safety uh, that was quite a bit larger than the one that we uh, have put forward here, but that was the, the most recent genesis of uh, the work to uh, reframe the agency concept using modern constructs and the, the current operational um, methodologies that are in place to, to create the best possible product. And that's how we landed on um, what you see before you as the, the executive order. Um, this is a piece of a larger modernization construct that we began talking with you about uh, in December of 2019 and then into the uh, uh, beginning of the session in January of, of 2020. Um, there's a slide deck that I sent, which is an updated version of a slide deck that I presented last year on this topic. 
Uh, and there's additional information in some of the uh, historic uh, versions of that slide deck and, and other documents available at our modernization site for anyone listening and any committee member that wants a little bit more uh, of the background from last year. Uh, so at a high level, um, it, this is a piece of a variety of modernization strategies that are outlined in the, uh, the slide deck that I, I sent you this morning. We could spend four or five hours going through those things, but in the interest of ensuring that we're on point and using your time most effectively, I'll, I'll go through a couple things that I was, I was asked to do, uh, including uh, differentiating between the existing structure and what would change under this executive order, and then some of the high level uh, components of uh, why this is an improvement over the current uh, operating state. So to begin with, uh, a quick primer for, uh, I know there's a couple of new committee members, and uh, if you were walking the actual hallways uh, of the State House, you'd hear people referring to secretaries and commissioners and often inverting those terms, and while it really doesn't matter all that much, the difference between an agency and a department and state government and the difference between a secretary and a commissioner is um, supposed to be clear cut, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. An agency typically has multiple departments in it, which are led by commissioners. A secretary leads an agency, uh, but that's not always the case. For example, the Agency of Education has a secretary, but no departments, therefore no commissioners. Um, and there are both departments and agencies that exist in the 12 person governor's cabinet. So the Agency of Education, for example, which has no departments, the Agency of uh, Human Services has multiple departments and multiple commissioners within it. Uh, the Agency of Commerce, where I came from before this, has three uh, commissioners uh, within it. Uh, the Department of Labor is a cabinet level organization that has obviously no sub departments, but divisions. The Department of Public Safety is much the same, and I could keep going through that list. Um, but the so the construct of state government has both agencies and departments. And while uh, oftentimes folks think that there's a hierarchy to them, there isn't always a hierarchy to them. So uh, what this would do, however, is to create. Uh, well, let me go through the department uh, first. The Department of Public Safety exists as a cabinet level organization. Uh, it has uh, four divisions and then a variety of other um, uh, organizational units within it. Uh, the largest division is the division of the Vermont State Police led by a director who also has the title of Colonel. Um, the division of fire safety, the division of emergency management, and then a division which is uh, the administrative division which is our, our budgeting and, and finance and, um, and uh, technical folks in that arena. And then in addition to that, we've got a division uh, that is the Vermont Forensic Laboratory uh, led by a director. Uh, we have the Vermont Crime Information Center, uh, Radio Technology Services Group, the Marijuana Registry, and, and a host of other smaller components, some of which are embedded within divisions and others that exist uh, in parallel uh, to those divisions. That's the existing structure uh, of the department. Of note, there are other components that are related to the operations of public safety with small p, small s, that exist outside of the Department of Public Safety. And there are a variety of ways that those things have been defined over time, but most commonly, the types of things that are contemplated in either historic legislation or in historic studies and reports are the Vermont uh, Police Academy and the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council, the 911, E911 operations, the 911 board, and the four other law enforcement agencies in state government that uh, exist in parallel to the Department of Public Safety and are embedded in other departments or agencies. There have been other historic constructs that have contemplated doing things like moving other regulatory entities into a, a super agency of the department, uh, an agency of public safety. Uh, certain drafts have uh, had things, uh, including moving the Department of Corrections into a, uh, an agency of public safety. Um, so there have been differing definitions of that public safety umbrella, but the one we're working with is essentially sworn law enforcement and anything to do with emergency operations uh, exclusive of 
uh, emergency medical services, which uh, for good reason exists within the health department because uh, they uh, are operating under physician's licenses. So they're uh, much more closely aligned as an extension of health operations than of, um, of the types of things that we're talking about that exist within the Department of Public Safety and Vermont's public safety um, traditional infrastructure. Um, so that's the backdrop in the existing landscape and a little bit of the, uh, the history. Um, I could walk through our various strategic priorities, um, but without going into the weeds of each one of those, um, they exist in a, a, in a number of different uh, lanes of the same highway, if you will. Um, modernizing the way we deliver services, enhancing services to Vermonters, ensuring that we're providing enhanced service to other public safety operations statewide, that is police, fire, and rescue organizations throughout the state, whether that's uh, with training, integrated training, fair and impartial operations, um, communications and communications infrastructure, uh, et cetera. Um, Simplifying the way we deliver things is a, is a core tenant. Uh, the more complexity, the more expense there is, and, and arguably the, the less effective uh, we are in many instances. Uh, and developing an overall construct for the way that we look at the delivery of safety services has been a core tenant uh, for many years and, and something that we've accelerated in the last um, year. And one of the reasons why uh, the agency of public safety appears to make uh, good operational sense um, right now. We've spent years continuing to add fragmentation to the way services are delivered, not just in public safety, but across a whole host of things that government delivers. And oftentimes it makes sense to take a step back and determine when and how uh, to consolidate and streamline some of those things to decrease that fragmentation and complexity in order to deliver better service. And that's uh, one of the underlying principles um, behind why the uh, agency construct is a piece of our overall uh, modernization uh, strategy. On slide eight, it gives you uh, a, an overview of the four components uh, of our modernization initiatives um, from the internal components of how we're budgeting, uh, planning for capital expenses, aligning internal effort. Um, the second um, bucket, if you will, is the modernization and organization of, of, pay, of state public safety assets. That's where the agency model comes into play. Uh, modernizing support for county, municipal, and other nonprofit public safety assets. We could talk about that for uh, uh, an entire uh, uh, day with all the things that we have going. Uh, I'll talk about some of them when we talk about the agency in just a moment. Uh, and then finally, informing and supporting the development of a statewide criminal justice and public health safety system. Uh, and at, toward the end of this presentation, we won't have time to get into it today or some of the core constructs around how to deliver uh, that. So with that as the backdrop, I'm gonna skip through the overall modernization um, deck and into the public safety, uh, agency of public safety model uh, more generally. When you look back at the 23 plus reports and studies that have been done over the, uh, a little bit longer than my lifetime, uh, historic versions have failed for a couple of primary reasons. Um, first, they've been efforts at saving money. Uh, this is not about saving money. This is, uh, there may be some, some savings uh, in terms of investments going forward in the future, uh, but it is not an effort at budget cutting uh, in the near term. Um, there have been historic fears, uh, particularly in the law enforcement components of this, that, that, that uh, anything absorbed into, the, into an agency would simply be sublimated to the state police as the largest law enforcement agency in Vermont. That is not, um, that is very uh, carefully contemplated in what we've put forward here. Uh, and the structure is uh, such that we insulate against that uh, happening in a couple of different ways, which I'll uh, describe uh, in a moment. Uh, and finally, the complexity. Some of the models put forth have suggested as many as eight or more departments existing within this super agency, something that would get close, uh, not quite the size of the Agency of Human Services, but pretty close to the size of the Agency of Human Services. Um, this is not that. This is a far more streamlined um, 
version of the agency model, uh, I think, than any of the ones that have been put forth uh, historically. It should be noted from the outset that this approach, the agency construct, is currently endorsed uh, by the chiefs, the sheriffs, uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, the, um, the prior Criminal Justice Training Council, the new council has just begun meeting, so they have not gotten to this level of depth in their conversations yet. Um, and not only this particular construct, but uh, the, those organizations and many others have endorsed this concept for 30 or 40 years, going all the way back to 1974. Uh, so this is not a new, um, a new idea and not something that comes as a surprise either to uh, legislators who have been uh, through this many times, um, but also to the, the, the operational folks who execute public safety strategy uh, statewide. Um, so how does this, how does the agency, we'll pivot now to how the agency differs from the department in terms of its um, what's contemplated as a construct and then what would actually move under this particular executive order and then what would happen subsequent to that. Uh, as put forward, we would create two departments and a division inside the agency of public safety. So one of the things we wanted to do is not cascade the size of state bureaucracy to create more complexity and more costs. So we, we very intentionally streamlined uh, the size of the organization to be um, efficient and, and not uh, overly costly. Uh, and in doing that, we created uh, two departments, a Department of Fire Safety and Emergency Management and a Department of Law Enforcement alongside a Division of Support Services. And I'll walk you through what goes inside each one of those things, beginning with the Department of Fire Safety and Emergency Management. Uh, both fire safety and emergency management are both within the Department of Public Safety now. Uh, they would exist under a commissioner. Um, within that uh, department would be the Division of Emergency Management, um, the fire safety operations as they exist now, which include uh, fire safety and building code inspection division, uh, the fire investigation unit, fire prevention and safety, our technical response unit, which is the hazmat and urban search and rescue and swift water teams. And there's the opportunity to, to make some uh, movement in there, depending on uh, a, a variety of um, uh, assessments that are, are done once that uh, department um, were to begin operations, but no substantive alterations are envisioned uh, early on. Uh, so that, that one's relatively straightforward. Uh, no new components of the agency would exist uh, under that particular department. The, the second department would be the Department of Law Enforcement, which would also have a commissioner. Uh, right now, the Vermont State Police obviously are inside uh, the Department of uh, Public Safety. What's contemplated here is we would move, uh, the, uh, the first and only move directly contemplated is to move the motor vehicle enforcement staff they would retain their statutory charge. They would retain their director in parallel to the director of the Vermont State Police. Um, and they would exist within the new Department of Law Enforcement. One of the advantages there is uh, adding another executive uh, to this is, uh, is beyond needed with the amount of work uh, that's going on, both legislatively uh, directed work and work that the executive has got going in terms of modernization of the uh, operations of law enforcement assets, particularly in, in state law enforcement. The amount of work is uh, pushing the boundaries uh, pretty well beyond what our existing staff could do. So adding just the additional uh, addition of one more executive is, uh, is something that we would certainly welcome. Um, but that's not the, the main reason for doing this organization. This component uh, would begin to streamline a variety of different things. As we talk in the larger modernization construct about sharing assets, whether that's radio communications infrastructure, technology, uh, the information technology systems, the facilities themselves, um, vehicles, specialized vehicles. It is, I know it's not gonna surprise anyone that uh, state government is good at doing each of those things multiple times over. 
we have multiple radio systems. We have multiple buildings for public safety operations. We have uh, multiple specialized vehicles that have different words painted on them from Vermont State Police to Vermont Fish and Wildlife to Motor Vehicle Enforcement. Um, while there is not an enormous savings to be had in the near term, as I outlined in the beginning, going forward by unifying uh, the delivery mechanisms of, uh, of these parallel organizations, there will be uh, more substantial opportunities to share assets, uh, whether that's vehicles, uh, radio towers, communications infrastructure, IT systems, which we tend to buy multiple times over, uh, or facilities. Uh, and you heard me talk about this last year as we build new barracks, we envision those to be public safety facilities and not only facilities for um, those who are working within the Department of Public Safety, but there are opportunities potentially to extend uh, offers to others in state government, but also others in municipal and county public safety to share those assets to the greatest extent possible and then deliver more uh, unified, efficient, uh, and high level service to Vermonters as a result. And this is just a one piece of, the, of, of laying the groundwork for that kind of future delivery mechanism. And that I, I would describe the entire agency as that, not just this uh, Department of Law Enforcement. And it gets even more interesting as we start to unpack the division of support services, which is next. The components that exist already inside uh, the Department of Public Safety include the administrative division, uh, we have communications in two forms, the two public safety answering points, the dispatch facilities that the state runs, and a radio technology services unit, which maintains uh, critical radio frequency, point-to-point uh, -point radio communications, uh, microwave systems, and other communications assets, including a telephone system, uh, all maintained by that unit, not only for the Department of Public Safety, but for other state assets as well. Um, I'm gonna not talk about the things we're, we're gonna bring in until the end here. We have uh, Fleet Services Division, which is currently uh, split between the state police and uh, other fleet services right now. We have the Forensic Lab Division, which I mentioned, the uh, Training Division, which has training facilities and all of the fire training uh, oversight. There is a fire training council, much like the Criminal Justice Council, that guides fire safety training. But the operations, the budget, um, the administrative support is all done by the Department of Public Safety. And, and finally, the Vermont Crime Information Center, uh, including the Sex Offender Registry, the Marijuana Registry, and, and other uh, information services are all run within the department. All of those would go under the support services division, which would be led by a deputy secretary. And in the construct of the agency, we would move two components of state government in there. The first would be the Vermont Criminal Justice Council on, in July of 2021. Uh, the uh, operations and budgeting and administrative support for the academy are the core things that would gain additional support uh, they'd be elevated in their view within the executive branch. Um, they have more closely tied to public safety operations statewide. Um, that's th that is the core component uh, or the core. Those are the core reasons for moving um, the operations of the academy and the criminal justice council. It is an underfunded area of uh, of state government. Uh, it needs additional infusions of administrative support, budgeting support, and of cash. And um, put quite simply, um, embedding them into a $130 million enterprise creates a variety of new opportunities to provide that support with the staff we have of over 620 people. Uh, and uh, let's say, for example, it was um, the General Assembly wanted to invest another $500,000 on top of the $2 million that the um, Criminal Justice uh, Council currently has at their disposal. Um, that looks quite different set against a $2 million budget than it does set against a $130 million budget in the Department of Public Safety or the Agency of Public Safety. So there are significant benefits um, to accelerating the work in criminal justice training by aligning it directly with uh, a state entity uh, or an executive branch, a uh, direct executive branch entity uh, like an agency. 
What we do propose uh, in this construct is the independence of the criminal justice, originally the Criminal Justice Training Council when we talked about this last January, uh, but certainly the same extends now, the new Criminal Justice Council, the independence of that council and their statutory charge would remain. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, the representative nature of that is important in the same way that the representative nature of the Fire Service Training Council is important. Um, but also because, uh, you know, put quite frankly, if you get the wrong person in my job or the wrong person in the secretary's job, um, they could do significant damage to the delivery of that system without the checks and balances of a representative training council because that council is not um delivering service only to state assets it's delivering service across uh, the entire spectrum of law enforcement in uh, throughout the state so having that representative component um, is uh, we believe remains critically important um, as you contemplate uh, the agency and then finally um, moving the e911 operations uh, into a communications division alongside the two PSAPs, the public safety answering points that we run and the radio communications technology unit. Uh, this is something that the legislature actually directed now two years ago. They directed the secretary of administration to determine not if, but where the E911 operations should go in the executive branch. Uh, and this is an extension of, of that work. Uh, Again, we envisioned and we have proposed that the 911 board, because uh, 911 operations again touch all facets of public safety and all public safety operations statewide, not just state operations, that the board retain uh, its current role, uh, but that moving 911 into the agency of public safety would allow a couple of, of key things to occur. Uh, one, again, the budgeting and administrative support uh, alongside the talented team that they have. Um, but uh, equally uh, important and, and actually, uh, I think, pretty exciting, um, attaching the 911 operations more closely to the operations of the two PSAPs and the radio technology unit would allow us to really move forward with a unified uh, vision for the future of emergency communications statewide, rather than having separate entities along parallel paths whether that's uh, unifying investments or strategy, or again, uh, equipment, um, engineering prowess, uh, technical capabilities, you know, cross-pollinating those things has great advantage to Vermonters with one of the most important uh, pieces of our uh, overall delivery system, which is the ability to pick up a telephone or a device and be able to access emergency services as swiftly and efficiently uh, as possible. I'm going to pause for a second. I'm happy to now I can walk you through the timeline or we can go into more depth on sort of what it what this is and what it isn't um, at your discretion. Well, let's open it up for a moment for questions from committee members um, about any of the shifts that uh, the commissioner has talked about so far. Rob LeClaire. Rob, we need you to unmute. Sorry, I clicked on the button. I just didn't look. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good, um, good afternoon, Mr. Sherling. How are you, my friend? I'm well, sir. How are you? Good, good. Um, I have several questions uh, around this. Uh, I guess the first being I've, I've heard um, that we're looking to make some significant changes uh, structurally. My question would be is what difference would say, for lack of a better expression, the frontline force or the boots on the ground, what would they see? In other words, if DMV became a part of this larger agency or different agency, what, what, how would it affect them? How would it affect the officers that, that work for DMV? And the other question I have is, is Vermont kind of an outlier in that don't most, I guess, states have their emergency services broke down at least by county, where Vermont, we seem to have it even down as, as far as town go. But the main question I'm looking for is just so 
where would somebody like DMV, how would that affect them in your opinion? So immediately there wouldn't be significant changes that, uh, that they would note. Um, I would hope that what they would see was, uh, is additional, um, uh, attention and additional uh, focus on their needs and their ongoing operations as they attach to an organization that is whose primary mission aligns directly with their primary mission versus being directly attached to an organization whose ancillary mission aligns with their primary mission, which is uh, enforcement and safety. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the that's the primary thing. They would continue to support DMV operations. Uh, because there are other components of uh, what the Department of Motor Vehicle does uh, does in terms of um, regulatory oversight and support for uh, a variety of different things that they would continue to do in much the same way that emergency management, uh, fire safety, and uh, state police provide support to other components of, uh, of state government. Um, but the, the first thing I think that would be noted is uh, the alignment of vision and effort uh, around delivering uh, public safety services, in particular enforcement and regulatory oversight that um, would benefit from uh, being attached to a, a larger organization with the same mission. Very good. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and I'm... <laughs> Mr. Shirley must be breathless after that introduction. I certainly am. Um, I, my curiosity, uh, being a new kid in this uh, enterprise, has to do really with how would the delivery of services, the um, decision making, um, the uh, directness of access uh, up the chain of command, if you'll excuse the expression, how would that be different, what, what in short would be sacrificed, if anything, and in the conversion, as you've described, the current day, and obviously we have on the paper, uh, the creation of the two divisions, and if you like, combination of some of the fragmented parts, if you, as you've described it. I'm, I'm, I'm searching around for what should I watch out for as I evaluate this proposal? in terms of what would be lost, either in the efficacy of decision-making or the quality of the services delivered. And feel free to use either Department A or Department B, so to say, as the context for that. Sure, that's uh, a great question. Uh, and one of the things we very uh, intently focused on was not to create a bureaucracy that would water down decision-making, uh, create additional layers of bureaucracy that could impair um, communication, uh, decision-making, et cetera. Um, essentially, you'd be going from a leadership team that has seven right now uh, to a leadership team that has nine. Um, so that's the primary difference you'd add to commissioners. Um, that would actually add capacity. So uh, whether it's the, the speed with which decisions can be made, uh, the amount of communication that could flow, the volume of communication that could flow, um, I think those would be enhanced with this, uh, this particular setup, uh, as opposed to having a, a large bureaucracy as was contemplated in some prior versions of this. Um, and uh, I feel like there's a second piece to your question and I'm, I'm not able to put my finger on it. So is, is there a piece that I'm missing? Uh, just the, uh, the sort of architecture in terms of whether it is efficient in the in the, almost the uh, physics sense. Can you make a decision and implement it quickly? And what would the quality of service, if if any, uh, be sacrificed? Uh, the interface between, as uh, my good friend Rob Leclerc said, boots on the ground and the general public who are consuming those services. I think what you would see in terms of service provision is an incremental increase. I wanna be really clear uh, that all of the components that we're talking about um, moving together, uh, both in, in, at this stage and the ones that might, we will study a little bit further and contemplate how we might move them in the future uh, are all high functioning in general, um, but there's some incremental additional uh, service that you would get. So for example, uh, uh, and this is a micro example, uh, 
uh, between emergency management, uh, fire safety and the department and the state police, uh, the uh, search and rescue teams operate out of, the, out of the Department of Public Safety primarily. Uh, adding the, um, the 911 folks, potentially adding uh, in the future fish and wildlife to the, the agency of public safety, that's something that's contemplated in the executive order to be looked at in the future. Those kinds of additions um, would add expertise and tie together more closely teams that operate separately that could deliver better service to Vermonters. Um, and that one's probably not the best example because fish and wildlife is contemplated to be in the future. Um, in terms of um, uh, motor vehicle uh, highway safety, having the expertise uh, of the commercial vehicle enforcement teams tied closely together with um, the operations of the state police can could potentially create some efficiencies, could create some um, additional uh, um, the ability to brainstorm on strategy more closely. And, and, and folks will say, well, why can't you just do that now? I can't just take two pieces of state government, have them sit down in a room and work on those things. You can. It's completely different having two components of state government or state government and municipal government collaborating uh, on a case by case basis, which is the way it works now. It's completely different to have those exist side by side in the same organization and constantly continuously collaborating and improving operations to Vermonters. And that's what we're, that's what we're shooting for. Same thing in, uh, in communications infrastructure. So by taking the expertise and the talent from the folks in 911 are doing a great job right now but attaching them to folks that are doing a great job with PSAP operations and, um, and radio uh, tech, technology services and those engineers and infrastructure folks, what we hope and, and certainly plan will happen is that we'll unify our investments and enhance the service to Vermonters by doing things like, here, here's another micro example, take all those components, we need to stand up a new tower to do a uh, microwave relay for um, uh, PSAP operations and 911 operations. Well, at the same time, in that particular service area, there's two police departments, a rescue squad, and three fire departments that have substandard um, uh, communications infrastructure for their radio frequency. Why aren't we having all of those players together at the table, led by this new communications team, to stand up a tower that everyone co-invests in or the state purchases and just allows folks to put their communications assets on it. That's thinking that's not happening right now. And we envision that that's the kind of accelerating um, continuous improvement that will be enabled by doing the things that we're proposing here. How Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner Sherling, for the overview. Um, and as I understand what's being proposed, uh, the goal is to modernize um, the enterprise, uh, possible reforms, cost effectiveness, um, efficiencies. Um, and there are a lot of moving parts to, to, to this effort. So my question is, what will this cost? What are the hard costs? What are the soft costs? And when I say soft costs, you know, training, cultural shift, whatever it takes to bring together one agency from multiple pieces. So what will it cost approximately? Obviously but, you don't have a- Well, the short answer is about $400,000 in, uh, in salaries is the cost. Uh, the rest of it is, um, there are potential you know, again, incremental savings and really what I would describe as cost flattening uh, in the future. Um, so whether that's, uh, you know, buying a piece of radio test equipment that can be used in 911 operations and radio technology services and buying it once instead of buying it twice, those are the kinds of incremental things that um, we certainly think will happen. Uh, buying, um, Highway safety gear that um, right now is bought, uh, you know, once in the DMV operation and once in the state police operation. 
There are instances where we think we're going to be able to buy one of those things instead of two or two instead of four or two instead of six. Uh, and then in the future, as we get into, um, you know, the discussions around whether uh, the warden service were to join the, the agency or not, we have specialized a, a host of different kinds of specialized vehicles, dozens of snowmobiles, ATVs, mm -hmm. uh, and specialized vehicles that are bought multiple times over. Um, and we paint, like I said in the intro, you know, we paint there's no wildlife on them. We paint Vermont State Police on them. Why don't they just say State of Vermont boats? They should just say State of Vermont on them and we share those assets across all of the safety services. Um, I believe to include municipalities instead of buying a boat for XYZ Fire Department, we should have a fleet of boats. They're trained to use those assets and they're shared instead of maintaining, storing and purchasing. Um, an exponential number of assets than the ones we actually need at any given time. Thank you. And if I could just follow up, what what challenges do you envision for this this process of creating an agency of public safety? Well, the first one we're engaged in right now, sir. So convincing the uh, <laughs> legislature that this isn't something some nefarious uh, thing that's going to break state government. Um, I don't believe it is. I would not be part and parcel of something that I thought was going to in any way be detrimental to the delivery of safety services, something I have dedicated my entire life to. Um, then the, the next thing is we have to be very careful uh, as we bring in the components into the agency uh, that the primary asset, we keep talk, I keep using the word assets and usually I'm, I'm talking about um, physical things, but the most important asset we've got are the people. Uh, we have people that deliver exceptional service. Um, there, there isn't anything broken about the way that um, the Vermont Police Academy operates, 911 operates or DMV operates, the three components that we're talking about moving into the agency. The advantage is the is it's a mathematical advantage by taking a positive number and adding it to another positive number and multiplying that talent out. That's where we think that the huge advantage is. It's not about trying to fix something that isn't working well. It's about elevating the level of service. And that's the most important thing to communicate uh, and to make sure that that transition happens and that folks do not feel like they're sublimated to what is currently the larger organization, the Department of Public Safety, they're coming in as, uh, as equals, as, a, uh, as part of the public safety, small p, small s family. That's the biggest challenge is to make sure that is executed well. So we not only continue to deliver great service to Vermonters, but that we elevate that service as a result of this work. Thank you. John Gannon. Thank you, and thank you for testifying today, Commissioner Shirley. Um, a question, going back to Rob's example about boots on the ground with DMB. Um, now, any law enforcement officer has some discretion about what laws they enforce, correct? They do. So if public safety was to take over DMV, the, their determination of what discretion to apply would become public safety's responsibility and not the Department of Motor Vehicles. Would that be correct? Um, I suppose if we were to, uh, you know, sort of hyperanalyze, that could be accurate. But important to note that much of uh, DMV's focus is based on uh, national standards. It's based on data-driven approaches to where to focus uh, in much the same way that the state police are. Um, one of the arguments I heard early on last year was that uh, if you took the other entities uh, that are law enforcement facing and you put them inside the Department of Public Safety or the Agency of Public Safety, um, the risk is that they become 911 responders. I can assure you that that, is, that will not happen unless there's, a, you know, obviously a, a, a significant emergency, in which case that already occurs. Um, but the reason I can say that with confidence is even prior to my arrival, uh, at the Department of Public Safety, you don't see that happen with the state police. We're not taking the technology investigation unit or the executive protection unit or the uh, drug unit. And, and those are just three examples of a variety of folks that have specialized focus 
we're not pivoting them to take 911 calls or we're not taking them out of their assignments to go do some other XYZ flash in the pan um, priority. So uh, ultimately everyone um, rose in the same direction relative to the state's priorities, but there, is, there are diffuse priorities and there are diffuse needs um, relative to law enforcement and any other component of uh, the current Department of Public Safety. And I think, uh, no credit to me, but the uh, the way that the organization is set up uh, enables the requisite level of focus, regardless of what your assignment is. Well, I appreciate that you and have everybody respond to 911 calls. That is your personal decision. I mean, if you chose, you could have everybody respond to 911 calls if everybody was under the Department of Public Safety. That's true, but the, I mean, the, the, the the premise of the question we would be breaking and it, whether it's me or someone who who follows me you'd be breaking our ability to do other core components of the delivery of public safety services so while it's technically what what you're saying is technically possible you, the commissioner or secretary could direct that um, operationally that wouldn't make any sense there are just too many things the, the scope of service. Uh, in the existing department and in the proposed agency uh, still has to have a requisite focus on all the key areas of operation or we will not be achieving public safety in Vermont. So following up on that, what interface are you gonna have with the department of motor vehicles with respect to their priorities um, with respect to enforcement? Because all of a sudden you're taking away their enforcement abilities, but there's still another department, not under your authority yet, um, how would you coordinate with them? So it's the sworn components only that would be coming to uh, the agency of public safety. And uh, we, you know, we put most simply, uh, we coordinate across uh, the cabinet on uh, a daily, day-to-day -day basis on everything you can imagine. Most vividly over the last 10 months, um, uh, only back up a little ways. That has been the case or had been the case for three years prior to uh, COVID coming to our shores uh, in early March uh, of last year. And what we've seen since then is all of that communication, all of the collaboration that happens among the various departments and agencies was taken out for a serious test drive with COVID. And as a result, that is one piece of why the state's experience with the most substantial emergency in, in human history in the last 100 years has been so successful. We would simply be replicating that on a micro uh, basis relative to DMV operations. Okay, so I have a second question which deals with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. They, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but right now they have an independent budget from you, from public safety, correct? Correct. Now, once this merger occurs, they no longer will have a separate budget. It'll be subsumed within the public safety budget. Yes, they would have a division budget would still exist separately with separate codes. But yes, it would be part of the larger construct. But you, but you would have overall responsibility for that budget. Yes. And so given that, if you were unhappy with, say, the way the council was handling unprofessional conduct cases, you could start starving the council for funds. Uh, only to the extent the General Assembly uh, concurred with that because the, the budget is passed by the General Assembly as proposed by the executive branch um, with particular line items uh, authorized. And we only have the ability to move uh, small components of that once the budget has been galvanized where you could hire an executive director that was totally opposed to the council's mission to investigate unprofessional conduct, couldn't you? Except that the council uh, would be weighing in on, on that appointment and ultimately that would go to uh, the governor. So there's a political overlay to, uh, to key appointments as well. But you would have a lot more say in that appointment. Um, I would have probably more than I have now as a single council member, yes. So I, I just have to say I'm very concerned about what I think happens under this executive order 
And that is that what was an independent council becomes not independent and it becomes right under law enforcement's authority once again, which is something we tried to eliminate in S-124. I would disagree, sir. Um, and, and, and that's because uh, the commissioner or secretary of public safety has some responsibility to law enforcement, but my responsibilities are far more diverse than that. I'm not a police chief. The police chief is Colonel Birmingham. And um, the, uh, the, the, I believe the opposite, and, and our intent is exactly the opposite of what you're describing. Our intent is twofold. One, that the council retain its independence and its ability to guide the operations of criminal justice um, both training and um, uh, professional regulation with no change there, but to give them all of the assets of a 600 plus person operation and a $130 million budget instead of a seven person operation and a $2 million budget. Okay, thank you. Peter Anthony. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I'm sort of going uh, in a slightly different tack following Representative uh, Gannon, though, in trying to figure out, um, back to my earlier worry about what, what's the um, uh, sacrifice, I use our word, but, but what is, there's got to be some kind of trade off in this, there invariably is. And let me ask a question, uh, which I think you alluded to the test that COVID has presented the state of Vermont and all the uh, services which were <clears throat> challenged during the, uh, the uh, pandemic since uh, last March. And let me, uh, sort of a thought experiment. Suppose we have another uh, stressor. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to evaluate and think about the new construct. If there's another Irene, if there's uh, a, a, a natural disaster that we're not even familiar with at this particular moment. And I'm thinking of <clears throat> communication central over in Waterbury <clears throat> and who would be in the room, who wouldn't be in the room under the new construct, <clears throat> what assets would be able to be harnessed and who would be able essentially to bring a debate to a close and say, this is the way it's gonna be, let's get going. That's it's a sort of a stress test for the new construct, I guess. Yeah, it's a great question. That's the <clears throat> one thing um, that would not change at all. Uh, and the reason is this, that in the state's emergency operations plan and the way we execute emergency operations, everything falls under the state's emergency operations center in the case of an emergency. Now, uh, COVID's a little bit of an anomaly because it is is primarily a health emergency. So health operations is uh, has a a different role than in an Irene, et cetera, because it, there's just so much decision-making that has to happen that's based on, uh, on health policy. Um, but for the Irenes, the, the floods, which are, are, more ty are, are most typical uh, disasters in Vermont uh, or anything else, um, all of the assets of state government uh, end up under a unified command system, which is run by the state's emergency operations center. So they're, whether they're embedded in the agency or then they're in their current um, locations doesn't change much. Uh, we have uh, the Department of Public Safety uh, has the ability uh, under existing statute to, uh, to pull all of those strings in, that, in those worst case scenarios when there's an emergency. Thanks. All right, um, so thank you, Commissioner. I, um, I have one other question for you and then maybe we can spend a moment just jogging through um, your any final thoughts you have. Um, coming back to the Criminal Justice Council, um, of course, the legislation that was passed um, out of this committee last year uh, made some significant changes to the council, um, really with our intention and focus on um, beefing up the ability of the council to be a professional regulation um, organization. Uh, I appreciated Rep Gannon's concerns um, about 
the council budget and and um, uh, and resources being uh, allocated to the council um, being more um, uh, more directly related to whether that's given approval by the fifth floor. Uh, but I want to come back just uh, a little bit to the substance of what the council is doing as a professional regulation entity. Um, we we are very concerned that they maintain uh, their independence. Um, and you mentioned the the strength of them as a representative body with members of the public and and you know a broader diversity of inputs. Um, what can you tell me about how the council would maintain its independence if, for instance, as you said in your presentation, the wrong person at some point in the future has your job? Um, I, I have concerns about that, and I'd like to understand how you see um, putting some guardrails around that. That's a great question. The uh, part of the uh, the early convert the early legal gyrations uh, this afternoon um, tangentially touched on this what the executive order does is it creates the agency and it moves the 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 support the budgeting as I keep saying the budgeting and the administrative support for the operations of the police academy to public safety it very expressly states uh, that the council retains its statutory charge and responsibilities so whatever statutory charges you give to that council exist in parallel to those given to the what, now the commissioner of public safety. What the order says is the responsibilities of the commissioner will fall to the secretary um, because there will just be a name change initially. And then any other alterations that you choose to make uh, statutorily, we'd certainly be interested to work on some additional things. Um, but because of that, uh, there, the Secretary of Public Safety would not have the ability to impede uh, or interfere with the council's statutory charge and, and relative to, um, to, the, to the oversight components and uh, professional regulation. Um, I believe that that separation is uh, is important and would welcome uh, a back end conversation. I, obviously, my my first request is let's create the, the organization that is the agency and move the components that have been contemplated, and then let's also work to make sure there aren't other enhancements. I'm confident that there are that, that the way the statutes are currently framed that there won't be problems because the uh, the, the council's given a particular charge and the secretary is given a particular charge and they don't touch. Um, so that's good. Uh, but I would also welcome uh, an exploration and a conversation about any potential um, enhancements to that going forward. Okay, um, so <laughs> I understand that, the, the, that conceptually what you're saying about the council maintaining its independence uh, however, we had some conversations with the council last week in which the council said, you know, we need a full-time attorney to help us navigate these 25 or so allegations of professional misconduct. We need an investigator. We need a program technician. Um, and at the same time, uh, over the past many um months, we have heard, I have heard um, many commissioners and secretaries talk about there being a hiring freeze. And if the this governor or a future governor decided to institute a hiring freeze, um, but was being told by this, um, by this very critical uh, law enforcement oversight body that they needed these assets, uh, these uh, additional positions, how can we be assured that those positions would be made available? Um, well, I can't speak to the assurance that positions would be made, would be made available, but I can speak to, uh, having come from commerce, we had a number of both uh, sort of cross-section of governance and advisory boards, and I would put the Criminal Justice Council in more of the governance board role. They have specific statutory authority to do certain things. They are not advisory. 
um, it was not unusual for those boards to, uh, even though they existed with the, again, the budgetary and administrative support of the Agency of Commerce to come to the legislature and say, um, you know, despite the fact that this is not in the executive branch ask, we need X, Y, or Z. So there's, and that's just one example. I think that construct exists throughout um, probably all of the agencies and departments. Um, I'm actually struggling to find an example of that within the Department of Public Safety currently, but um, the Fire Service Training Council may lobby independently for investment, independent of the executive branch. I have to check with the director on that. Well, yes, but we all know that in a very tight budget year, um, you know, the, the, the first plan get, that gets laid on the table is the governor's plan. And uh, if the legislature strays from that, uh, we have to somehow find the, the funds to do those important things. And I, it's just a, a nagging worry in the back of my mind. Agreed. At this point in time, um, the, the goal is the opposite of the fear that you have, um, which is uh, we need to invest more. We need to give more resources to, uh, in particular, the operations of uh, the Academy and the Criminal Justice Council because there is so much accelerating work to be done. Um, and we see, I, I in particular see uh, a, th their move to the agency as accelerating that investment, not the opposite. Now, same fear, and you know, you elect a different governor in whatever number of years, and the priority changes. Um, but the same the same challenges exist as that. Uh, I think, as Director Sheets will tell you, um, from my conversations with him, I think he will be relaying something along the lines of the the challenges of being that two million dollar budget up against our hundred and thirty million dollar budget, which is up against AHS's two point five billion dollar budget you're just lost in the morass. So there are more advantages in terms of investment and, uh, and moving forward than disadvantages. Um, I'll stop there. Uh, adopting a Dr. Levine term, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. John Gannon has a question. Well, well first a comment. Having worked for a federal independent agency, there is a vast difference between an independent agency and how it deals with administrative changes than a agency that's not. Um, you know, you can't pump a lot of political appointees into an independent agency. Um, there's a lot of ways to ensure that such an agency does stay independent from the administration who may have very political views on things. So I am very concerned about the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. And I also am concerned about the perceptions that people are gonna have. When we through S-124 really tried to increase the independence of the council and many people could see this as a step backwards that all of a sudden the council is now under the police's control yet again. How do you undo that perception? They're not under the control of the police, sir. They are in the, the, that's exactly why the Department of Law Enforcement and the Division of Support Services exist in different areas of the agency. And it's exactly why, as I drafted it, uh, I made a deputy secretary, which is above a commissioner in charge of that Division of Support Services. But again, is the public gonna understand those fine distinctions? If we collectively describe exactly that, I think uh, the answer is yes. If we politicize this and, and uh, decide to spin it in a particular way, then the answer may be no. All right, any other questions from committee members? Mark Higley, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, in your discussion around uh, the sharing of uh, equipment in particular, whether it be snowmobiles, boats, and so on, um, I think it brought to mind to me, in a sense, the rivalry between even 
um, town fire departments where uh, when there is an actual fire, uh, mutual aid comes together and everybody's on board. I, I'm just wondering, um, is it a similar thing uh, with uh, uh, the ranking file, the, the boots on the ground, so to speak, whether it's DMV, whether it's fish and wildlife folks, that they take so much pride in, in their uh, symbol on the side of that snowmobile that says fish and game. Uh, have, have you reached out to any of the, uh, uh, like I say, the rank and file folks as to uh, what their feelings are for this overall um, overall approach? The, the not relative to the equipment sharing component um, because it's uh, it is concept now that we're we're slowly starting to move towards some version of reality. Um, I should be even more clear. It doesn't even have to have a sticker on it. It could have a decal that says Rutland County Sheriff that they slap on there when they're using it. That's fine. It's a it's about sharing the asset. That is uh, is the important piece. You know, at any one time in Vermont, how many uh, rescue snowmobiles do we have in use? The answer is not that many, but how many do we have out there? More than we need. Um, the answer to how many we need is not two, but it's not 200. And it's, it's trying to figure out those things. It's how many radio towers, uh, how many hundred foot towers in one county do you need? The engineers can tell us, um, but the point is we should build one in the correct spot rather than two because in two different spots because folks wanna have theirs in their own backyard. Uh, again, I can understand that, but you know, I also know that, like I'd mentioned in fire departments, pretty, pretty much each department has such pride in, in their equipment, their own equipment, their own abilities. Uh, I know they always come together, but I, I'm just wondering how it would be if there was a whole Northeast Kingdom Regional Fire Department. Uh, oh, I, you know, that's a great point. That's that's not what I'm suggesting here. Although other reports have said that this is about how we're organizing the state assets and how uh, we may share those assets more widely. Uh, not, it, it, I'm not. Uh, please don't take um, my descriptions as advocating for anyone to regionalize their services. I would simply refer them to other reports as they uh, debate that going forward. Okay, thank you. Hal Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, in, in your uh, PowerPoint, you noted um, uh, historic versions that have failed at this effort, and, and you listed some, some points. Um, can you point us to a state or states that have done this successfully in terms of standing up an agency of public safety? Uh, not specifically the transition. There are a variety of states that organize uh, their assets this way, that there's a, a version of what we call public safety. It could be called a variety of different things, and they're all under one particular uh, umbrella. So this is a, it is more common, I think, to have these kinds of assets unified in one place than fragmented in the way uh, that Vermont does. And that's a it's more of a New England construct. The, the, the older states that have smaller municipal control versus someone mentioned it earlier, there are many states that county government has a much more robust uh, uh, intersection with services. Um, it, it's a function of, uh, of that more than anything. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hey, Mike. Um, as presented, this, this sort of is registering with me, particularly with the equipment stuff, and to some degree, the chain of command stuff is like on, on demand inventory control, which kind of works well until you have more demand than you have inventory. Um, and, and in this particular sort of situation, I can see uh, fish and wildlife people needing a boat, but there are three held in reserve just in case there's an emergency someplace where they're no longer in control of their assets uh, because they don't have any assets. It's a communal asset. Um, that, that's sort of bothersome because it's kind of like the, the public safety truck with the ram on the front of it. It's always in the wrong end of the state when you needed to ram somebody's door down. Um, the other thing is I'm hearing from people in the field that uh, the, the best example I can use at this point in time is the guy that goes around 
to inspect inspection stations and he stumbles upon fraud, he's usually got the DMV inspectors right there in his department to do something. It's not gonna exist anymore. He's gonna have to go up another tree and down another one. So there are several examples of that sort of enforcement being taken away and leaving investigatory, but no enforcement capacity where they left. Um, then there's yeah. of course always the idea that the state police and the motor vehicle inspectors always argue about who gets to go out and weigh trucks in the afternoon. But so there's a there's a really smart guy uh, on the West Coast named Gordon Graham. He's a risk manager. And my favorite Gordon Graham saying is there's two things people hate, the status quo and change. Yeah. And uh, what you're hearing is the fear of change. Um, the difference between someone doing an inspection at uh, an inspection station and coming across a fraud violation and calling someone who currently sits within DMV versus calling that same person who happens to sit within an agency of public safety, there is no difference. The phone number will remain the same. The charge will remain the same. The support that that person has relative to their um, in in enforcement um, role will change. They'll have a bigger bench to pull from, they'll have more technology to pull from, they'll have a bigger budget to pull from, et cetera. But operationally, um, there's, you know, it's a false narrative there. There's the, the asset remains um, focused on, uh, on what it's focused on now. The asset does, but the control of it shifts. Ultimately. Yes, it, and, it, and it gains more support for its mission rather than less. That is the goal. I, that I, these are not. And I, I realize that, that's the goal, but going back to Representative Anthony's question, that's kind of a lack of perception so far, and it's new. Well, it's not new. It, this has literally been discussed since the year before I was born, and studied twenty-three times since then, and they all say exactly the same thing. So. Um, it's, it's new this month uh, in executive order form, um, but these concepts have been vetted and re-vetted um, dozens of times. Uh, unsuccessfully, I suppose, is probably the, but that's, that remains to be seen. New people, new decisions. Thanks. So Commissioner Sherling, um, you have, uh, I think a few more uh, pieces of um, paper that you have submitted to us. Is there anything else that you'd like to go over with us? Uh, there's the, the agents, there's an, an overview and sort of the high level overarching goals and, and things on a Word document. And there's the slide deck, which puts the agency in context with the overall modernization strategy. Um, a lot of the questions that we've been through are, are things that are addressed in that uh, three or four page um, Word document. Um, and, I, and I could go through them point by point uh, to have them on the, uh, the audible or, or video record, but I'm not sure how constructive that will be for um, the committee members. So I'll, I'll defer to you, Madam Chair, whether you'd like me to go through more of that or or just leave it to the, the three or four pages of synopsis there. And there, I should note, and it's noted in the document that on the modernization site, there's a, there are additional components. And anyone who's interested in reading the literally hundreds of pages in the reports that uh, we've called together, I'm happy to uh, share that directory with you if it is in any way useful. Committee, I will leave you to um, jump in if you will have a preference on what the commissioner has offered and um, otherwise we can wrap the committee hearing for the day. I'm not seeing anybody jumping in and asking you to back up and go slower and say it all again. If I may, Madam Chair, I'll just reiterate that this concept, whether it was in uh, prior administrations with prior legislatures and prior reports has been vetted thoroughly 
uh, time and time again, including this time around, we have engaged um, numerous stakeholders and there um, are no substantive reservations. I, I'll, actually, I shouldn't even hedge that. I just, there have been no reservations voiced um, uh, around moving this finally forward after 50 years of, uh, of contemplating it. Thank you. So I appreciate the conversation. It's been a long afternoon um, and I feel like we have peppered you with questions, but rest assured we will do this again. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. I, I do understand uh, some of the skepticism and I, uh, and I understand those who are, are uh, fearful of change. I can only say to those who are listening who may be fearful of that change that um, this will, if it moves forward, it will improve um, public safety operations and, and service delivery to Vermonters uh, and not in any way impair uh, our employees' ability to deliver that service. Last call for questions from committee members. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. I hope that you have a good rest of your afternoon and uh, we will see you again in committee soon. Thank you very much. Have a good day. So that is a wrap for today, committee. Um, we are back on tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So I will see you all just a few minutes before nine and um, Mike Merwicki has his hand up. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I haven't looked at the whole schedule for this week, so I, I may be jumping the gun, but I'm just hoping we can set aside some time uh, to discuss where we started the committee hearing today. Uh, I find it puzzling that the administration came forward with, with uh, um, at best, a puzzling uh, opening move uh, of trying to dissuade the legislature from exercising their own due diligence and, and uh, really putting a, 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 a gate up before us, we even took a look at their proposal. So um, there, there's, a, there's more there to unwrap and I hope we get a chance as a committee to, to look at that. We most certainly will. Um, and I suspect there will be other opinions that um, that come before us before we're uh, before we're done discussing whether to move forward with this on its merits and how to deal with the um, misinterpretation of statute that's contained in these executive orders. Um, Peter Anthony. Thank you very much. Um, I I just want to draw my uh, colleagues' attention to the last whereas before the now therefore, um, it, was, it's, it's, it goes to the heart of my puzzlement and it's a separation of powers problem as, as I, I'm famous, I guess, for saying, but it, it says something like, and I, if I understand it, the executive order, and I'm reading it, provides a framework uh, for the agency to be created, which the executive and legislative branches can work together to establish agreeable policy, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just puzzled because it's like we're, we're partnering with a separate but equal entity of state government, but that's not the way I think about my job. And, and it's just so confusing to me um, and doesn't help me uh, grab the substance of the proposal as, uh, Commissioner Sherling has laid it out. I keep getting distracted uh, with the, the confusion over what our role is. And I'm, I don't know, maybe I've got less patience than Mike or Ricky, but I, I just, uh, uh, I wanna not spend time if it's not gonna be productive, I guess is my, where I come down. Well, I guess I would, I would add to what your concerns are um, just the, 
the other concern that even if we were to agree with the substance of this executive order, there would need to be significant legislation passed by both chambers in order to enact this, whether it becomes, uh, whether it comes into existence by virtue of this executive order or not, um, there's a lot of statutory changes that need to be made. And so we would, uh, you know, hope that the administration would be planning to propose legislation to that effect. That would, that would clarify our role for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the devil's in the details, which is why we go over our legislation so very carefully as we are contemplating it. Um, any other questions, comments, or committee discussion on this before we wrap for the day? All right. Thank you all. It's been an interesting afternoon. Now we get to, to um, sign off and go see if we can scrape together some of the details.